Hello everyone and thank you for attending today's webinar. First, before we get started, I'd like to thank Stripe Tech for sponsoring this webinar and providing this webinar for free for all. Today's webinar is going to consist of a part two of a four part series. We're gonna be focusing on fatigue, load symmetry, ratio and efficiency, specifically on utilizing it on how to provide injury mitigation utilizing EMG sensor technology. So before we get started, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Marco Nunez. I am a performance athletic trainer. I've been practicing as a performance athletic trainer for a little bit over 20 years. Majority of my experience has been in the professional setting, like uh, my resume says there. Most recently, I was the head performance athletic trainer for the Los Angeles Lakers. If you have any questions regarding EMG, regarding Strive Tech, regarding any uh, functional stuff, you're also welcome to DM me at Marco A. Nunez 17 on my Instagram account. So here's an outline or objectives for today's webinar. First, we're going to just going to address and review fatigue versus muscular fatigue, or I should say overall fatigue compared to muscular fatigue specifically. Next, we're going to be discussing a little bit of the compensatory strategies or patterns that are due to fatigue that athletes undergo to try to complete their task or complete their sport. Second, we're going to see a relationship between fatigue and the compensatory patterns. And then we're going to be talking about some studies of how fatigue is related or affects ankle injuries, along how fatigue is related to or also affects ACL injuries. And then we're going to dive into specifically fatigue and the comp compensatory patterns. And finally identify how fatigue can be identified with Strive technology. So what is fatigue in general? or overall fatigue. So in 1994, Rothwell finally came up with a definition that's been widely known for fatigue. And basically the fatigue, according to Rothwell, is, de is defined as a during a maximum contraction of many mixed muscles. It is common to see a 50% reduction of force over a period of a few seconds. Now this is referred to as far as overall fatigue when an individual is utilizing all their muscles, their aerobic and both anaerobic, capacities and it's reduced by 50%, then at that point it's considered fatigue or an athlete is at the fatigue stage. Now, when we differentiate overall fatigue compared to muscular output fatigue, there's a slight difference. So like in the slide before, Rothwell identified when an individual or an athlete reduces their overall output now keep in mind overall output by 50%, then they're considered in the fatigue stage or overall fatigue stage. Gandivia in 1998 identified a little bit different fatigue manner where we're looking at the muscular fatigue. So of particular interest is localized progressive muscle fatigue, which has been defined as according to Gandivia, an inability to maintain required force level after prolonged use of muscle. So here we're looking at the muscular output fatigue specifically to an individual. Now we can go ahead and either do an overall lower extremity muscular fatigue or we can pinpoint specific muscles whether hamstring, quads, groins, glute, calves, or any such sort. We can also look at the upper extremities where it can be the pecs, the biceps, but we're identifying the specific muscle or, the, or specific muscle group in this area, not overall fatigue. An individual can maintain or can result in muscular output fatigue in a specific lower extremity, but still not have overall fatigue. And this is what we're looking for when we're looking for compensatory patterns. When a specific muscle group or specific muscle fatigues, but the athlete is still able to produce and participate in their sport or their task. So they're not overall fatigued, but the muscle has fatigued or a group of muscles have fatigued. So what happens when a specific muscle or a specific group of muscles reach a fatigue stage? Again, the athlete overall is not fatigued. The athlete has not reached that 50% of overall anaerobic and anaerobic fatigue stage. They're still able to produce. They're able to compete. They're able to participate in their task, in their game, in their practice. But a specific muscle or a specific group of muscles have reached a fatigue stage. So what happens in, the, in this part? 
So while reduction in forced productions is obviously detrimental in many circumstances, progressive muscle fatigue has been shown to impair these three areas. Number one, postural instability. So Johnson 1998 identified that muscular fatigue by a group of muscles can result in postural stability. Carpenter in 1988 identified that muscle, muscular output fatigue can result in lack of muscle coordination. And finally, Jarek in 1997 identified that muscular output fatigue by a group of muscles or specific muscles can inhibit control of limb velocity and acceleration. So overall, all these three areas can compensate or can affect an athlete's performance. So based, continuing on the slide before, that we identified the three areas that muscular output fatigue can produce. And I touched upon it a little bit in the last slide. How does all these muscular output fatigues, whether it comes to posture, postural, how does it affect the athlete? Well, fatigue induces performance deterioration due to these three specific areas that was identified. One, a reduction in force production, overall force. Lack of accuracy, in other words, if you're a pitcher. And then three, it reduces the speed of motor response. And this comes back to reaction, change of direction. So in the previous slides, we've identified what fatigue is. We've identified the difference between overall fatigue and muscular output fatigue. We've identified how a group of muscles or individual muscle can create some compensatory patterns or what, what results from the muscular fatigue. How that muscular fatigue not only affects the reaction time, the postural, the coordination, but how those inhibitions can affect an athlete's performance. They can do reduction in speed, more importantly, reaction time and whatnot. So oftentimes, like I mentioned in, in our last, our part one of the series, is that human beings or athletes in general are what we call compensatory machines. We learn how to compensate to be able to perform the task. Oftentimes we kind of go and go and go until we can no longer compensate and either one, we're completely fatigued, two, our body shuts down, or three, an injury occurs that no longer allows us to continue that task. So here are an examples as far as once an athlete reaches that compensatory output fatigue stage, they reach the compensatory strategies. And these are some of the things that we're going to be talking about. So the initial sign of fatigue may be overlooked due to enormous compensatory strategies that athletes may employ to achieve the goal despite reaching fatigue. And like I mentioned, this is what we're looking for as healthcare providers, as athletic trainers, as physical therapists, as strength and conditioning coaches. Our job is to identify these compensatory patterns, hopefully avoid them. I don't know whether we can completely stop them, but we can definitely reduce them, so to speak. And once we can identify these compensatory patterns as healthcare providers, we can hopefully reduce the risk of injuries. Athletes will do what they need to do. There may be signs that we don't identify, but when we're, where we can identify, this is where we want to go ahead and address the issues. Now, here are some examples of compensatory strategies by athletes. So the first one's a swimmer. One of the biggest examples, obviously, when you're swimming, whether you're doing the butterfly, the free stroke, using upper body and lower body movements along with core stability to be able to kind of propel you through the water. So in this example, a swimmer may switch from predominantly arms to predominantly legs intensity to be able to maintain required speed of propulsion. So in other words, if the athlete's upper body or, or upper extremities are starting to get tired, their arms, their back, their chest, they're going to use more of their lower extremity forces, their legs, to propel them forward. And vice versa, if they start reaching muscular output fatigue in their legs, for example, their hamstrings are no longer firing correctly or they're not producing the exact force that they need to or the hip flexors or their quads, then they're going to go ahead and compensate by utilizing more of an upper body issue. Now, what happens when they start compensating, especially if, if it's an upper body issue? The anatomy may start developing some shoulder issues, some scapular issues. If they're compensating with the lower extremity and utilizing more power force from the lower extremities, what can happen? They can sustain a hamstring issue, hamstring strain, and even the sword. So whenever the athlete compensates, as we all know, that's when some of the risk of injuries can increase. Another example, gymnasts. They often switch practice from so-called swinging to supporting 
um, apparatus to floor exercises in order to distribute workload and use different muscle groups to continue the workout despite fatigue. Same thing. So if, so if a gymnast is in a specific area, for example, here like the high bar, and they start feeling fatigue as far as upper body, lower body, they may switch to a floor exercise. They may switch to the parallel bar somewhere else where they, they, they may experience less muscular fatigue in the specific area so they can continue working out and continue doing the task. Now, all this is normal. This is expected. That's why they're athletes. Like I mentioned, just humans in general, we are compensatory machines and we're expected to do this. Just like when you're tired, when you're tired at home, you want to keep going. You take a cup of coffee because you need the caffeine to get that kick in and you want to try to kind of cheat the fatigue factor. You want to keep going. In other words, the reallocation of resources is one of the strategies to maintain the motor task productivity despite progressive muscle fatigue. Again, this is normal. This is expected. But this also increases the risk of issues or injuries in a specific area when athletes or humans in general start reaching the that compensatory stage or that so-called quote-unquote reallocation of resources. And again, as healthcare providers, this is what our job is to kind of identify these compensatory patterns and hopefully one, reduce them and hopefully at the end, eliminate them if possible. So how do we know how the fatigue and the compensatory patterns kick in, so how it affects. There's been plenty of studies done as far as related to fatigue and sports in general, or how it affects, it affects athletes. So in 2010, Zabri et al. did a study that found that muscle fatigue induced by a stimulated handball game elicited alterations in neuromuscular responses. In other words, reaction time was reduced uh, during, the, during this event. The muscle wasn't able to produce any muscular output as much as the, the athlete wanted to do. So their neuromuscular responses or reaction time was reduced. Another study in 2018 by Savage et al. They found that larger knee joint angles and knee extensions and internal rotation moments during a sidestep cutting task following a prolonged running protocol that stimulated a game-like activity were reduced. So in other words, athletes that lower extremities or muscles groups in the lower extremities start fatiguing, they start doing in the compensatory patterns or default position. So in the previous slide, we showed two studies that were performed and done and to identify how fatigue affects um, performance. Now we're gonna look at how fatigue, or which, was, which leads to compensatory patterns, which then can eventually lead to um, injuries or issues. So in this study right here, we're going to focus on how fatigue is related to or affects ankle instability. So a study done by Yofani et al., um, they studied the effects of the glute max and glute med muscle fatigue on functional performance and balance in athletes with and without chronic ankle instability. So in other words, they wanted to determine how much does the glute max when it's fully rested versus when it's in a fatigue stage, how does it, that affect ankle stability or chronic ankle stability, both with athletes that have a history of ankle and chronic ankle stability and with athletes that have had no issues with ankle instability. So in order to perform the study, they obtained 24 physically active participants from the sports of basketball, volleyball, and football. And they focus on these specific sports, especially basketball and volleyball, because the number one injury sustained in these two specific sports, along with football, is ankle sprains or ankle stability, chronic, both also chronic ankle stability. So these 24 individuals were divided into two groups, 12 females with chronic ankle stability and 12 females as a control group that stated or reported that they had no issues or no history of chronic ankle stability. And what they did here is that they tested them pre and post. And what I mean by pre and post is they stepped in, tested them at a, and during a rest period or rest stage, meaning they were well rested, no issues, ready to go. And then what they did is that they ran them through a program or a protocol that they targeted to try to kind of fatigue the glute max and glute mid muscles. And they tested them afterwards and wanted to see exactly how much chronic instability or how well did the ankles perform after those, these muscles were fatigued. Now they targeted these muscles. There's also been plenty of research study that both the glute max and glute meat are huge components that affect um, ankle and also knee stability. They're the, one of the major um, stabilizing muscles for the lower extremities affecting both the knee and the ankle. 
So here's a list of the fatigue protocol. And like I mentioned, they ran them through the test. They ran them through a fatigue protocol. Every of those athletes, all 24, had to go through this specific protocol. And their goal, target goal, like I mentioned, was to try to max out and fatigue the glute max and glute med. So they ran them through one five minutes of max goal running program. They required them to do eight repetitions of hip abductions with hip at 60 degrees and knees at 90 degrees. These are also known as clams. Eight repetitions of sideline hip abductions. Eight repetitions of single leg limb squats, also known as pistol squats. Eight repetitions of lateral band walks with static band around ankles, also known as monster walks. If you see the gentleman, uh, the young gentleman at, the, at the top. And eight repetitions of multi-planar lunges, both sagittal, frontal, transverse planes. So they were pretty much targeting every different area, different angle of the glute max to try to fatigue it as much as possible. And they required them to do this in all areas. Now here's the list of the performance and balance tests that the athletes had to go undergo both pre and post fatigue protocol stages. So before they even went ahead and did the, the fatigue stages, this is what they had to do and then post. So they did a figure eight hop, single leg hop. They did the side hop, which you see the image, the second image from the left. They also did a crossover hop. And then finally they were required to do a square hop. So here are the results of the study. So after they test them pre, and they, they required to go through a glute mass, glute mass fatigue protocol, and then they te retest them afterwards. So the participants in both groups had increased functional performance test times that indicated that fatigue had a negative effect on ankle performance, which could lead to exposure to recurrent sprains and instability. In other words, both groups time to be able to complete the task was reduced. Now this is kind of interesting as far as when it comes to time. This is something we're going to touch upon later in the slides in this webinar as far as how or why time is utilized as a method to determine fatigue stage and then how strive can actually help you improve that and why time in itself should not be the number one factor or the number one um, focus on determining whether fatigue kicks in or not. But that's later slides, slides on the road. Next, overall ankle functional performance of participants in two groups was defected as there was an increased time of all functional performance tests and decreased balance scores. Again, they had difficulty time maintaining their balance and their time also in increased. Uh, but this happened to, to both groups. Now, the only difference between all these tests is showed between the athletes that had already reported having chronic ankle stability compared to the athletes that reported not having any issues is that the side hop and the square hop test were the only ones that identified a significant difference between the chronic ankle stability and the control group. So even though there wasn't anything significant for all tests, the study was able to identify that athletes that had a chronic history of chronic instability, ankle instability, once they reach a fatigue stage, they had a higher increase of risk of injury when it came to the side hop and the square hop test compared to the non-chronic ankle stability athletes. So what does the study basically tell us? Tells us one that basically the glute muscles, both the glute max and the glute meat, play an important role in increased frontal plane motion of the knee when landing, increased knee valgus and tibia external rotation. It also tells us that the hip muscles, fit when fatigue protocols result in an altered force production, proprioception, coordination, and landing kinematics that affect the lower extremity, such as ankle, and put it exposed to sprains. So like I mentioned before, the fatigue factor, or when the athlete reaches a fatigue stage, they're going to reach a compensatory pattern as well, which puts the athlete at a higher risk of injury. This is something that's very commonly known among, among healthcare professionals, athletic trainers, physical therapists, strength and conditioning coaches. So our goal is to try to kind of maintain or reduce the fatigue factor or actually be able to identify the compensatory patterns or train our athletes or teach our athletes how to stay away from the compensatory pattern as much as possible and not reach a um, default position, which then puts them at a higher risk of injury. So now that we had touched upon how fatigue affects or is related to a, uh, ankle injuries, now we're going to look at the secondary or actually probably the primary most common injury among athletes that's debilitating and can put them out for a good minimum of six months up to 12 months, and this is ACL injuries. So now we're going to look at how fatigue is related or affects ACL injuries. So in this program or in this section here, um, we're going to look at a study that was performed by Ann Benjaminist, 
um, in 2019, where they reviewed the role of fatigue in anterior cruciate ligament injury prevention. Now, when it comes to ACL injuries or ACL preventions, there's a lot of variables and a lot of factors. One of the biggest one, of course, is change direction, where at least most of the common injuries when it comes to ACL injuries is when an athlete has to change direction due to a different variable or due to an appointment, they have to pivot, turn, and you'd see a bunch of a valgus, or oftentimes you see the knee or the foot kind of lock onto the turf or the floor, it doesn't rotate, and then all the forces that are being applied from the ground is sent right to the knee, which then kind of results in either an ACL sprain or ACL tear or ACL rupture. In this study, on the other hand, they weren't looking at the change of direction. They were looking more at the landing mechanics. They were looking at the single leg landing mechanics. And here, if you see the image with the young lady, I believe she's a volleyball player. When she lands both with two knees and one knee, you see a huge amount of valgus um, in both knees, but also at the same time in the single leg landing mechanics on the right hand side. So the objective of this study was to review literature that was helped to summarize the kinematic and kinetic effects of fatigue on single leg landing tasks. So they just looked at single leg landing tasks. So very similar to the study before regarding the ankle sprains or chronic ankle stability and fatigue, here in these studies, they also looked for participants that underwent a fatigue protocol. So they did the same exact thing where they had all the athletes go through a, an assessment or test see how they did pre-fatigue. They ran them through a fatigue protocol, basically. Their goal was to try to fatigue the glute max, fatigue the glute, the med as much as possible, and then run them through the same assessment, same test, and see and to see how well they would do, or to see how much the fatigue factor affected their single leg um, landing mechanics. So like I mentioned, the effects of pre and post fatigue and three-dimensional lower extremity kinematic and kinetics were compared the method of the data collection, patient selection, blinding prevention, and verification bias. So here they included 20 studies, um, which com comprise of four types of single leg tasks. One was a single leg drop vertical jump. The second one was a single leg drop landing. Third was a single leg hop for distance. And this one is oftentimes utilized a lot for return to play from an ACL injury, also known as a triple leg um, hop and then sidestep cutting. Um, this is more of a change of direction where the athlete has to place all the weight on one leg and kind of kind of go to uh, the opposite direction. So what they found is that the fatigue seemed to mostly affect the initial contact and the peak hip and knee flexion. The sagittal planes variables at initial contact were mostly affected under the single leg hop for distance and sidestep cutting conditions Peak ankles were affected during the single leg drop jump as well. So in other words, the fatigue factor affected all these movements and how the muscle was able to kind of fire during the initial contact. And that's one of the most issues, one of the, the main things that I've always have discussed. Some of my colleagues have also have said the same thing as some of the studies. It's not the matter of having strong glute max muscles or glute meat muscles, but it's more important of having that neuromuscular contraction that when the when you land that you want the muscles to be able to fire and be able to sustain itself to kind of allow some kind of knee stability and reduction in ACL injuries or ACL, or, or ACL issues. When the muscle is fatigued in this in the, in this manner, that neuro, neuromuscular contraction of the muscle is reduced, which then puts the knee at higher risk of injury along with the ACL. Now it may not be an ACL, it may be an MCL, maybe more of an athlete may start developing more of chronic issues such as patellar tendonitis, quad tendonitis, or anything of that sort. Um, the other also issue is that it may not result in just in knee issues, but it also may result in ankle issues, which kind of goes down the kinetic chain down to the ankle. Now, what they concluded here is that all return to play protocols are recommended to have some kind of reaction time or what they refer to as unanticipated events in a fatigue condition. So this is something that I've talked about and I think this is something that we've done a webinar um, last year uh, over on how fatigue affects return to play protocols. Um, oftentimes, most of these tests that we do as healthcare providers in a clinical setting or in what are called in a control environment, the athletes or the clients tend to be well rested. Um, being able to identify and test these athletes or individuals in a fatigue stage and see how well they perform should be part of the return to play protocol as well, along with some form of reaction time while in the fatigue stage. 
most of those have, have identified and as healthcare providers, we all have all concluded and kind of agreed that majority of injuries or uh, an increase of risk of injuries occurs when the athlete is in the fatigue stage. When they're in the fatigue stage, that's when they start um, getting comfortable. One, they start compensating. And as we all know, when the compensatory pattern kind of kicks in, that's when the athlete's at a little bit of high risk of injury, depending on where they're compensating, how they're compensating, how much they're compensating, and whatnot. So now here, we're going to get a little bit into a how Strive helps you identify um, the fatigue factor. Now, in this one here is a Strive is, is an athlete that's kind of working out or performing, um, practicing. And they're monitoring both their his, his internal and external workload. Now, this is something that's very commonly done. It's been done for a couple of uh, years already. There's plenty of companies out there that help you identify internal and external workload. Um, a lot of professional teams use these, this type of technology. Oftentimes, it's a wearable device and a little pot that oftentimes is either placed in your, in your back um, upper back type of thing to be able to kind of track an athlete's internal external load. So bottom line, external um, workload is basically the uh, the forces that are being applied to the athlete, meaning if the athlete's lifting the weight, um, pushing a sled, uh, having to run a certain mile, having to sprint a certain distance, anything that's being in any stressors, in other words, that are being applied to the body, those are known as external workload. The internal workload is the physiological demands that's being placed, that the body is exerting, um, how much muscular output, heart rate, um, sweat analysis, anything that the body is putting out in order to be able to complete the task at hand. So here we see both the internal and external workload. And this is often utilized to be able to kind of determine and see if whether a, a player has reached a fatigue stage and it's something that's been commonly utilized. Now, the orange lines, as we see, are the external workload. These are the demands that are being placed on the body and the forces. The, the, the single line there, the dotted line, I think like in a little bit of a blue or purplish type of thing, is the internal load. This is what the what the athlete or the body is, being, is producing. So if we start on the left-hand side, we see that there's a good amount of external load being applied on the body, but the athlete's not really working that hard. So the demands on the body aren't that great. The, body, the athlete doesn't have to exert themselves to be able to complete the task, which is fine. So we're following. So one of two things here, either one, the external load is not strong enough to be able to have the body, uh, the athlete adapt to the environment, uh, but that's a whole different uh, webinar in the part. So we, right now we're just looking at fatigue. So as time goes by, you can see the external loads kind of decrease a little bit, but they kind of maintain somewhere in the middle. But now the internal workload where the where the athlete has to kind of work harder starts increasing. So there's a point where the internal workload surpasses the external workload. At this point, the athlete's starting to reach a fatigue stage or the work is a lot harder um, than the, uh, the athlete anticipated. So he, he needs to kind of work hard here. But as we see this, we see that the athlete's internal load towards the three quarters portion kind of goes down a little bit and goes below the external load. So as a healthcare provider, as a strength technician coach, as a performance a data analyst, um, a sports scientist, we could probably identify this and conclude, hey, the athlete was able to recuperate or recover and was able to stay below the external load and was able to kind of continue the task at hand, which is fine, which is great. So based on this data that we see here, it tells, hey, you know what, fine. The athlete reached a little bit of fatigue stage, was able to recover, was able to recuperate, and was able to continue doing the task at hand. No issues, no problem, the athlete's fine. But if we dive deeper and see what's going on here, we may identify different patterns. So let's take a look. So this is a data that Strive also kind of collect along with the internal external load, loads on the previous slide. So now if we dive deeper and kind of identify, okay, what happened? How was the athlete able to recuperate? How was the athlete able to kind of continue on, even though it should, they, we were able to show that the that the his internal load su surpassed external load, this is what the Strive technology was telling us. So at the beginning, you, you, here we're dividing between the um, right limb or right leg and left leg type of thing and as you can see they're, they're pretty symmetrical at the beginning um, as the athlete starting to reach the fatigue stage or as we see that the athlete's um, internal load is increasing or surpassing the external load we can see some kind of compensatory patterns meaning that the athlete is using one leg more than the other this is very similar to the example that we gave with the swimmer 
when the swimmers are doing the freestyle butterfly, whatever it is, and they're ideally trying to use both upper and lower limbs symmetrically, if the upper body starts fatiguing, they're going to start using their lower limbs a lot more to be able to propel themselves or vice versa. In this case, this athlete was compensating by using one leg more than the other. If you can see the kind of the bluish line compared to the purplish line, there's a higher muscular output from one leg compared to the other. Now, if we even dive even deeper into the, the data analysis, um, this is what I refer to as peeling the onion. The onion, you just see the first layer. The more you peel the onion, the deeper you get into the data and the information or more the compensatory patterns that you can see due to the fatigue kicking in with the athlete. Here, we're looking at the specific leg that he was compensating on, and we're looking at the muscular output. We're looking at the hamstrings, we're looking at the glute, and we're looking at the quad here. As you can see, the athlete is pretty symmetrical towards the one-third portion of the beginning when we were able to identify that his internal load was pretty stable, but once his internal load started exceeding the external load, you can see the kind of story pattern as far as in the muscular output. So, so one specific muscle is being utilized way more than the other in that specific leg that was compensating. So here, the athlete is being placed at a higher risk of injuries or developing some kind of issues. Will it result in ACL? We don't know. Will it re result in a hamstring strain? We don't know. Can it result in something simple as patellar tendinitis? Um, quad tendinitis, um, hamstring tendinitis, and that sort of potentially, yes. But being able to identify this and be able to see it as a healthcare provider, we can go ahead and hopefully address it um, either at the moment while the athlete is doing the action or address it later um, during their routine or during their exercise for the following day. Now, here's a different study that was done with an athlete using Stripe technology to identify how the fatigue factor uh, changes performance or affects performance and it affects the compensatory pattern. Now, here is a runner um, that was doing laps around the track. Um, I believe it was at four, uh, 400 meters and they were timed. And this is something that I had mentioned earlier as far as oftentimes time or the measurement of time is utilized to determine whether an athlete is reaching a fatigue factor. For example, if you have an athlete here in this case, uh, you keep track of how many seconds it takes the athlete to sprint around the 400 meters um, as their time increases or the amount of time it increases for them to circle around, that would tell the instructor or the coach that, hey, they are starting to reach a fatigue stage. But that may not necessarily be the, the actual fatigue stage that they reach, what about the compensatory stage before the actual fatigue is identified, so to speak. So here we look at their graph, we look at the data that we were able to retrieve. As you can see here from lap one, two, three, four, all the way down to 20, um, laps one through, I would say nine or 10, they seem to be pretty stable with a little bit of increase of output. So they're using more force, more work, more muscular output to be able to accomplish the task. Around lap 11 or 12, we start to see more muscular output. Um, in other words, the athlete is starting to get a little bit tired, um, but they're able to still accomplish and stay within their time. Um, but they need more force produced to be able to do that. Labs 13, 14, 15, and 16, we start seeing a little bit of a breakdown on muscular output. And what that means is that there's no longer a consistency or, um, or symmetry between all the muscles being utilized in the lower extremity to be able to, to accomplish the task. So now we see a little bit of deviation, more compensatory type of thing. Once we get to lines, uh, laps 16, 17, 18, 19, not only is the muscular output decrease, um, but also their time starts to kind of decrease. So now here they're well into the fatigue stage. They're struggling out there. They're just trying to kind of get through the through, through the uh, through the task at hand and just be able to accomplish it and be done with it, so to speak. Now, here we're going to kind of go a little dive a little bit further and kind of break it down. Um, like I mentioned in the slide before, we saw that that reps one through ten or one through nine or ten were pretty. Um, symmetrical with a little bit of lap 8, 9, or 10, there started to be a little bit of increase of muscular output. In other words, the athlete had to start using more force, uh, more muscular output from the muscles to be able to accomplish the task, which is normal as expected. I mean, that's what the athlete is doing. Um, they, they, they're tiring, they're kind of fatiguing. Lap 11 or 12, you can start see, identifying that they start using more force to be able to accomplish the task, which again, it's almost expected, no problem. Like I mentioned, uh, laps 
13, 14, 15, 16, specifically 14, 15, 16, we start seeing a breakdown in the muscular output. The interesting part about this is that the coach was also timing the athlete per lap, and that's what they traditionally have used um, to determine when the athlete starts fatiguing, whether they're breaking down, and they time it. Just like any normal person, any normal track coach, any normal cross-country coach, you, the time, 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 measurement of time has always been uh, the number one method to try to determine how fast you're running, how slow you're running, whether you're fatiguing, whether you increase your speed, you decrease your speed. But the interesting part about this study is not until lap 18, 19, and 20 is when the athlete's time began decreasing. So in other words, laps 1 through 17, they were consistent with their time in completing the, the task, the 400. Time never decreased. So not until lap 18 that the coach was able to identify that time had increased. So it took the athlete a little bit longer time to complete the 400 each lap during this task. But Stride technology was able to identify that actually fatigue and the compensatory pattern began or started occurring in lap as early as lap 13, if not definitely in lap 14. So what we're looking at is that the athlete was compensating as she was running through these laps to be in order to maintain consistency in time while running these laps, she had to reach a compensatory pattern and be able to, to be able to accomplish the task. And as you can see, lap 14, 15, 16, 17, the breakdown of the form was already occurring, even though time or increase of time was not identified until the 18th lap. So this is a perfect example how the body is a compensatory machine, how the body is going to learn how to compensate once fatigue kicks in in order to maintain that time or, make, or be able to complete the task. Now, again, as healthcare providers, we can see that once a compensatory pattern occurs, that's when some kind of issues or injuries may occur. So in other words, in this case, the athlete, as early as lap 14, was already compensating, was starting to increase the risk of injury, and then, but not until lap 18 was when time was identified. Now, utilizing Stripe tech technology, if we dive deeper, like I mentioned earlier, we start peeling back the, uh, the layers of the onion and, and dive a little further on this athlete that did the uh, 400 meters um, individual race, and we were able to identify that some of the compensatory patterns were identified in laps 13, 14, 15, 16. That's when kind of fatigue started kind of kicking in uh, before time or before her, her, her time was affected, so to speak. So here we actually dive deeper and now start looking at what happened as far as the compensation pattern or what was going on. So we're looking at the um, limb symmetry. Basically, we're comparing the left leg to the right leg. The um, the one in the middle shows us the uh, left leg activation versus the right leg activation. And if we can see this, you can kind of see a little bit of a, of a pattern where the athlete starts using more of the right leg forces um, or the right leg to be able to kind of propel, her, propel herself and be able to accomplish her task and be able to um, stay within that time. At some point, both her left and right leg do not produce the same of muscular output as they did um, compared to the first 10 laps. So we compare even the last two laps, those last two ones compared to anywhere at the top, the first 10, there's a huge discrepancy between that point between both the left leg um, on the end, but you can see that there's a huge discrepancy also between just identifying the left and comparing it to the right as far as the athlete's trying to accomplish the task. Now, if we dive deeper, like I mentioned, still keep peeling the onions and keep going diving deeper into the onion effect and trying to see what, how is this athlete compensating in order to um, prevent, not necessarily prevent or reduce fatigue or reduce her time increment. So like I mentioned in the earlier stage when we're looking at the athlete was staying within a, a time requirement and she was actually succeeding at it. She was doing very well at doing it. Um, not until the final three laps where she was not able to stay within her time, but we were able to identify that by as, as early as lap 13, 14, she started beginning the common story um, pattern. So if we're looking at this, we're looking at, we have two colors, purple, and, and kind of like a little bit of a turquoise. The turquoise area identifies the left leg, basically the muscular output coming from the left leg. The purple one identifies the muscular output coming from the right leg. Now we're breaking each muscle group 
down into three in, in, in individual areas. So the top chart shows us the glute activation muscle, the middle chart shows us the hamstring muscular output, and then the bottom one shows us our quadricep muscular output. Now, as we can see, um, the first 10 laps were pretty symmetrical. We had a good amount of muscular output, even though there was slightly, slightly increase in muscular output from the glute muscle coming from the right leg for the first 10 laps. Other than that, the hamstrings and the quads were pretty symmetrical. If any, maybe there was still more muscular output coming from the right from the quad. So she was becoming more right leg quad dominant and left leg glute dominant for the for the first 10 laps when she was accomplished her task now as fatigue started kicking in comp story patterns started kicking in and we can see here some of the compensation patterns that are, are definitely kicking in even stronger so once you started kind of starting fatigue compensation kick in if we're looking at the very top chart which is looking at the glute muscle we can identify that even though she was left leg glute dominant majority of the time in the first 10 laps that left leg, leg glute muscle started shutting down. Now she had to compensate, and now the right glute muscle had to start kicking in in order for her to be able to accomplish her task. So she had way more right glute muscular output coming out of that because the left glute was no longer producing that muscular output, so it was already fatiguing. Same thing with the hand, where we're looking at the uh, at the hamstrings. Now we're looking more of a right leg hamstring production coming out of there as well. And even the quads, you can see that there was a lot more, um, even though there was consistently right quad uh, domination, that, that still kind of persisted. But the major compensation pattern was one, she was becoming more right leg dominant that where the data showed earlier. And then two, she was becoming more glute dominant and the hamstrings were kind of shutting down. And at the very end, the last two, three laps, you can see everything started diminishing down. That's when true, true, I guess, fatigue, you can, you can say it kind of kicked in. That's where she wasn't able to accomplish her task. She wasn't able to stay within her time and she had to kind of slowly shut down. But even though that's where the time measurement was identified, the comp steroid patterns utilizing Stripe technology was being, was identified as early as lap 12, if not 13. So this concludes our webinar. Thank you for joining us today. If you guys have any questions regarding Strive or want more information pertaining to Strive or would like to see a live demonstration of Strive, please contact or reach sports at strive.tech or go to our website at strive, www.strive.tech.com and contact them to be able to get more information, want a copy of this webinar or we'll like just be able to kind of demo some of the products and see how it can be utilized in your athletic training room, in your physical therapy area, or even in your strength and conditioning area. Also, stay tuned for our next part three and part four. Like I mentioned, this is a four part webinar series. Today is part two and we're talking about fatigue. Next one's gonna be based on performance, the load symmetry, ratio and efficiency. And finally, part four is gonna be about how you can use Strive technology on rehabilitation, more importantly, and return to play protocols to allow you to be able to determine as your athlete, or I should say be able to objectively determine when your athlete is ready to surpass that next milestone or criteria as a returning to play from an ACL injury, an ankle sprain, MCL injury, any knee issues, or any low back issues, or anything of that sort. So please stay tuned for part three, part four. You can also go to Strive uh, Strive Tech website to be able to identify and be, see the dates when the next ones are going to be available and register as well.